Alrighty. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the San Anselmo Library's virtual event today, Lawn Alternatives with Marine Master Gardener, Marie Narlock. I'm Sariana, the Adult Services Librarian at the San Anselmo Public Library. And before we begin, I'd like to thank the Friends of the Library and the Library Parcel Tax for always supporting our library. There are a few technical things I'd like to mention before we begin. Everyone will remain muted for the whole program. If you have a question for Marie, please type it into the chat box at the bottom or top of your screen, depending on where you have the functions located and what device you are using. All questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. I recommend selecting the full screen and speaker view settings. This can be found in the top right corner of your screen or on the left hand side, depending on your device. If you are on a computer, you might see some faces in a column on the left-hand side of your screen. You can choose to minimize this column using the horizontal lines at the top of the screen, and then you can see the full picture of the presentation. Thank you for your patience and understanding during this program. We are all still learning the ins and outs of Zoom. If you have any questions or need help with Zoom, please email me at slayland at townofsanandselmo.org. It's the same email you use to register for this event, or you can uh, use the chat box and send me a personal chat. And we are recording this event today, so if you um, have to leave early or you get kicked off for whatever reason, I will be sending the link to the recording for ev to everybody uh, either later today or early tomorrow. Our speaker today is Marie Narlock. Marie has been a UC Marine Master Gardener since 2004. She studied landscape design through the UC Berkeley Extension and Merritt College and completed sustainable landscape classes at Sonoma State. She reads the rights articles for the Marine IJ and is the editor of the leaflet, the UC Marine Master Gardener e-newsletter. Marie has designed demonstration gardens for the Marin County Fair over the, over the years, and she co-designed and managed the Marin Ventures Garden that serves developmentally disabled adults. Please join me in welcoming Marie Narlock. Yay, yay, yay. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much for coming. It's wonderful to see some familiar faces. So that is really exciting. So I um, guess I may as well just go ahead and launch in. So let's, let's, let's leap in. Let's see here. <clears throat> Oops, hang on. Oops. Okay, everybody see that? All right. Okay. All right. Uh, Sariana, can you tell me, is, it, is this clear? Can, can you hear me and see this? I can hear you and see you, Marie. Excellent. Okay, just checking. All right. So today we're going to talk about removing your lawn and how to decide what to replace it with. <clears throat> and this is our shameless uh, um, uh, reminder that if you just hold your cell phone up, even to the, on the, to the this computer screen, um, for those of you who are not already uh, Leaflet subscribers, um, we'd love to have add you to our list for a free quarterly um, a subscription with lots of good information uh, um, once a quarter. And um, this will be at the end of the presentation. So if, if you don't have your phone handy now, we can, we can do it later. So first of all, here's what we'll cover. We're going to cover reasons um, why we recommend replacing your lawn. We'll talk about three methods for lawn removal. And we're going to just um, uh, talk mostly about what to put where your lawn was. You don't have to take any notes or do anything like that because um, I'll, I'll, um, I'll hook you up with how to get to our website and, and so forth and um, where you can look at plant lists and all sorts of things. So first of all, so let's, get the, let's get the bad news over with first. So let's talk about some lawn facts, first of all. So first of all, 80% of, of us across the country have lawns. And they use more land and water than any single ad crop in the country. And half of our water goes to landscapes here in Marin County mostly for lawns because they are so thirsty. And um, a little known fact is that getting water to our homes takes 20% of the electricity in our state. 
So it's a gargantuan um, uh, ex you know, expenditure of energy. And of course, we're all, all trying to stay aware of that because of climate change. And lawn care is a huge industry um, that unfortunately uh, has a proclivity to pollute our air and water. And um, it, as you can see, there are uh, millions of gallons of chemicals and fertilizers and all sorts of things that get dumped into, onto lawns. Um, plus, there's a lot of noisy machinery that goes along with it. Um, and I know that we're a little bit more uh, evolved, perhaps here in Marin, we don't use all of these things, but um, in our county, it, it, is done, it, it is being used, and of course, certainly across the country. Um, the, the lawn chemicals, one of the risks of lawn chemicals, and some of them, of course, are things we consider safe, like nitrogen and so forth. Um, but the problem is that when they run off with uh, water, after we water our lawns or when, when it, after it rains, um, it, it runs off into our lakes and streams, and um, it really gets our insects and fish. Um, and so that ultimately disrupts the food chain, which is not something we want to do. Um, and this ultimately degrades our drinking water, not something we want. And uh, just to give you an idea of water consumption of lawns, a thousand square foot lawn needs about 35,000 gallons of water annually. This is the same as filling two swimming pools and most people over water. Um, and uh, another thing I'd like to add is that when we're planting our gardens, we, we really encourage people to um, invite pollinators and beneficial insects, all the good critters into our homes, into our gardens um, to enhance biodiversity, right? But lawns are monocultures. They're often called green deserts because they really don't do a whole lot in terms of um, uh, inviting the, the um, flying insects and other critters that we like. And finally, one myth I want to dispel is that lawns are not low maintenance. I think a lot of the reason why people put lawns in is just because they're familiar and they and people know how to take care of them. But you know, mowing and trimming and feeding and watering and weeding, all of that is something that it, they're, I consider them um, uh, uh, higher on the maintenance list than, um, than a conventional garden or a garden that we would recommend. So here are some specific EPA findings about um, lawn fertilizers, herbicides, and insecticides. And these are direct quotes. Some lawn chemicals threaten native plants by harming beneficial insects that safely control weeds and unwanted insects kind of backs up what I was just saying. Lawn chemicals account for the majority of wildlife poisonings reported to the EPA. Several types of cancer, immunoresponse deficiencies, neurological diseases, and birth defects have been associated with exposure to lawn chemicals. And the rates of lymphoma in pets of pesticide users are significantly higher than occurrences in the pets of non-chemical users. So that's just a, a reminder that we always want to try and, you know, do no harm when we're out in the garden. So one of the big issues, of course, in our state is drought. And as um, all of the fellow master gardeners here would, would tell you, it's really not a question of if we're going to have another drought. The question is when and how long, how severe um, our, the next drought will be. So. The four-year period between um, 2011 and 2015 was the driest since record keeping began in 1895. We know that climate change is, is making all of these climate extremes worse. Um, and so that's just um, further evidence of it. We know that 80% of California's water is used for agriculture. And um, that is, you know, so every drop of that is so incredibly valuable. We want to try and keep them, you know, keep their water supply uh, fresh and plentiful. But now this is interesting. During <clears throat> drought years, 60% of the state's water needs are met by groundwater, and that's up from 40%. That's a 50% increase. So that is that, and what happens, what can happen is in some parts of the Central Valley, the land has actually sunk by a foot or more every year. 
So we are actually are literally affecting the surface of the earth um, because of all the water we're drawing out of it. So main reasons to kill your lawn, save water, time, energy, and money, avoid chemicals, create wildlife and pollinator habitat, redu reduce noise, air and water pollution, and make better use of the space. So we had to get all that bad stuff out of the way. So let's talk about three methods to remove a lawn. Uh, or uh, to remove, and I also would add, to also you could just reduce, right? Some people will decide, well, I still have young children or um, whatever, and so they just want to make their lawn a little bit smaller. So that's an alternative as well. So, and, and the goal here is to end up with soil that's ready to be planted, right? That's important. So the first one let's talk about is, is digging it out. So for this, uh, you, you need a, what's called a sod cutter. And this can be very, you know, hard work. It can be expensive because you've got to rent the tool. And then, um, of course, you take that sod that you've dug up and you dump it in a landfill. And that can take a long time to compost. And while you're in the process of doing this with this machinery, it can disturb the topsoil and sort of, and you know, soil is, an, is a miracle. I mean, everything that's living in soil is a complete ecosystem. Um, it's a whole world underneath our feet. Um, and this really rips that up. It really disturbs it. And it also leaves weed seeds and roots. So, you, you, so you're left with sort of a problem area um, uh, to begin with. Another method, and you may see this, uh, every so often I see this around town, <clears throat> excuse me, is solarization. And with this uh, method, you mow the grass, leave the clippings and wet things down, and then you cover it entirely with clear plastic and you edge it with bricks because you cannot let in an inch of, uh, of air, right? You're basically just trying to bake it. And um, you want to try and leave this on for about two months. And this does kill uh, uh, sod and it kills weeds. Um, but the downside is that it doesn't build the soil at all. What you're, you know, it's incredibly hideous, of course, in the process. But I mean, even if that were okay, um, you're, you're just left with this, this patch of dead earth. And so if you're going to do something where you're going to put a path or a patio or something over it, then maybe that's an alternative. Um, but for planted areas, it's not your best bet. Then we're going to talk about this third method that we recommend, and this is called sheet or uh, mulch, uh, 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 sheet composting or sheet mulching. Sometimes it's referred to. You also hear it um, called la the lasagna method, which you'll see in a minute. Um, this is an easy, it can even be free or um, very inexpensive um, method. You can recycle material that you already have. It helps build healthy soil. It's terrific for soil. And you can sort of berm it up, mound up a little bit so that you can um, plant in it instantly. So the recipe for um, sheet composting is organic material, usually like some compost, um, or any other material, um, some cardboard and mulch. And you can see how it's just layered up there. Somebody in this photo is, um, they perhaps want to just do a little uh, planted area within this lawn, and so they're just sheet composting that particular area. And there is a slice of yummy lawn lasagna. So you can see how it's layered up. And I have a, um, a, uh, a, a short video that shows this process in action, so I'm going to play that now. Hi, my name is Kat. I'm a landscape architect, and today I'm going to show you how to rethink your lawn the bay-friendly way. Now here's what a conventional lawn looks like, ornamental and underused, but now lots of folks are transforming those lawns into bay-friendly gardens. These diverse and beautiful gardens will help you use less water, are easier to maintain, require less chemical fertilizers and pesticides, save energy, 
and produce fewer greenhouse gases. In addition, they also build healthy soil and plants. Replacing your lawn is a great opportunity to create a bay-friendly garden. You can create a habitat for bees and butterflies, start your own vegetable garden or orchard, create an urban retreat, or a perfect space for you, your children, and your pets. The possibilities are endless, and once you develop a plan, the rest is pretty easy. Now I'm going to show you how to sheet mulch. Sheet mulching is a cheap and easy way to replace your lawn. If you don't want to do your entire lawn, you can start with just mulching a part of your yard a little bit at a time. It doesn't require the use of heavy equipment or pesticides. And once you have the materials, sheet mulching can be completed in a day, depending on the size of the area you are covering. So let me explain how sheet mulching works. Sheet mulching is a technique of laying cardboard or newspaper over an existing lawn and then topping it off with wood mulch. The layers break down naturally to feed the soil with microbes, creating a vibrant ecosystem which is going to give you healthier soil and plants. But sheet mulching is also an ideal way to suppress weeds, build your soil health, and replace lawns. The best time to sheet mulch is in the fall to take advantage of the rains, but it can be done any time of the year. There are many different ways to sheet mulch, but I'm going to show you a simple way recommended by the Bay Friendly Program. First, you're going to prepare the site. If you have tall weeds, you're going to want to knock them down or mow existing vegetation so that it lies flat. Then, remove only woody or bulky plant materials. If you plan to retrofit your sprinkler heads for drip irrigation, be sure to flag the sprinkler heads now so that you can find them again when you're done. I'll show you all about sprinkler head retrofitting in part two. Now, some plants are going to need to be removed before sheet mulching, such as invasive plants that spread by rhizomes, bulbs, or that re-sprout from extensive root systems. Some examples include blackberries, oxalis, horsetails, kikuyu, and Bermuda grass. When removing these invasive plants from around plants that you will be keeping, be careful that you don't damage the roots of the plants that you are keeping. Next, we're going to soak the area with water to start the natural process of decomposition. To avoid runoff and keep mulch from spilling over onto sidewalks or driveways, you can use a flat edge shovel to cut the lawn away 8 to 12 inches from the edge of the concrete. The soil should be at least 3 inches below the grade. In other words, 3 inches below the top of the concrete. Your excess soil and sod can be mounted away from the edges and sheet mulched in place. If you're sheet mulching a lawn, just flip the edges over so the roots in the soil are face up. If you encounter the plastic netting that came with your sod, don't worry about it. Throw away the pieces that you see. Your leftover soil and any extra plant material or prunings can be used to create mounds for plants that like well-drained soils. Many native plants thrive on these mounds. Mounds also create more visual interest in the garden by adding height and depth. All right, once the area is prepped, then you're ready to install five gallon or larger plants. Next, you'll add a weed barrier it is essential that this barrier be permeable to water and air. Recycled cardboard boxes work great. You can get big sheets of cardboard from appliance stores or bike shops. You can also buy recycled cardboard rolls or use multiple layers of newspaper or burlap. Be sure you don't use plastic or weed cloth, which won't biodegrade. Remember, this is all about building your soil naturally. When you're placing your cardboard pieces down, be sure to overlap the pieces by six to eight inches so the sun won't get through them. You want to starve your weeds of light. As you're working, you can rip and fold the cardboard to accommodate the space around your plants. Now completely cover the ground except where there are established plants that you don't want to cover. Cover all green lawn to keep the sunlight from hitting it. Remember, any lawn showing at the end of the project will come right back. Next, we're going to wet down the cardboard to keep it in place to make it easier to shape around obstacles. When you're done covering the existing lawn with cardboard, it's time to add a layer of compost and mulch on top. Spread your compost directly over the cardboard and then cover it with bulky materials like wood chips to optimize weed control. Adding compost will help build soil. However, if your main goal is weed suppression, you can just add the mulch and skip the compost. In total, the compost mulch layer should be about two to five inches deep. The top layer of mulch mimics the newly fallen organic matter of a forest. 
Good materials for this layer include chip plant debris, tree prunings, leaves, or even straw. You are going to need a lot of mulch. Typically, a smallish front yard can take 18 cubic yards of mulch. To find local sources for mulch, please see the resources accompanying this presentation. Now that you've laid down the cardboard and covered it with mulch, you're going to punch holes in the cardboard and place your plants in the soil under the sheet mulch. In cooler climates, smaller plants like 4-inch pots can be planted right into the mulch compost layer on top of the cardboard without digging a hole. Don't worry, the roots will break through the cardboard. You will want to add compost just around the root ball if you didn't already add compost on top of the cardboard. If you did, you're good to go. Remember, your new plants will require water and attention when they're young, even if they're drought tolerant. Just a couple other things to keep in mind. Don't pile materials up against tree trunks or stems of plants. This will help them stay healthy and disease free. Especially during the dry season, small seedlings may need protection from snails and slugs that like to hide under the mulch. You can protect young trees from rodents with physical guards like metal bands that wrap around the base. So, congratulations! Your lawn has now been sheet mulched and you've laid the foundation for a beautiful bay-friendly garden that you will enjoy for years to come. Thanks for watching this bay-friendly presentation. Okay. Let's see if I can move forward. All right. So, um, as she mentioned, uh, flagging any uh, sprinkler heads is really important in this process because you can easily retrofit them. And um, all of these are available at irrigation stores or supply stores. Um, but to give you a, a sense of the difference in water that you might use, um, for instance, let's say you have a small lawn with seven spray heads. Um, if that runs, every 10 minutes that that runs, it'll probably use around 70 gallons of water. And even if you installed, if you sheet composted that and you um, put 50 plants um, where that lawn was and you ran that for 10 minutes, um, you'd probably use about eight and a half gallons of water every 10 minutes. The, thing to, the key thing to remember here is that pop-up sprayers that we use for our lawns are measured in gallons per minute. And drip irrigation, the little dripper with the little emitters, that's measured in gallons per hour. So, um, and of course, uh, there are also no water options. Uh, many native plants or some native plants, once they're um, good and established, um, will not need, would not need supplemental water. Okay, so you've smothered your lawn and you looked as fabulous as that gal in the video while you were doing it. So the question is, now what? Well, it does not have to look like this, so that's, that's a good thing. But it could quickly go from this to this, right? So this is my garden before I sheet compost, not all of it, but a fair amount of it. Um, and uh, it was not a super difficult process. Of course, we were starting from scratch. Uh, we we kind of mowed a lot of stuff down. So, um, but it goes to show you, this was just a few months after we installed it. So, um, uh, works really well. So the question is, how do you know where to start? And any of the master gardeners uh, in this audience can tell you that um, using your, uh, starting with your objectives is really, really um, what's critical. Um, and that is, how will that area be used, right? Do you need to walk on it or sit there? Or will kids play there? Do you need a new entry? Are you just looking for color? How is it that you're going to use that space? It's just so critical. And the other critical thing is the site analysis. And this is, I kind of like to define as like, don't kid yourself, right? If you have a site that's predominantly shady, and maybe that's why your lawn looks kind of icky there, because most turf grasses don't really do well in shade, well then be honest with yourself and say, okay, I've got this shady site. Right, and maybe you don't want to use a whole lot of water, and maybe you don't have a lot of time to maintain it. Going through these steps will save you a lot of headaches down the road. So, <clears throat> let's now we're just going to look at a little horticultural eye candy here. So, um, let's just look at, uh, let's just assume first that you want to replace your lawn with something that you can walk on. 
First thing to bear in mind is that a lawn really does not need to be manicured to be attractive. We're seeing more and more examples of this around, right? Here's one of the grasses that um, does a nice job of that. It's called Terex, uh, Carex texensis or the Caitlin sedge. It's a low growing clumping grass um, uh, that just gets about four to six inches tall. Um, uses some water, but not as much as conventional turf. And you can probably mow it about once a year. It's, um, if you don't mind this sort of soft billowy look. Um, Daimondia is an extremely uh, tough, uh, dense gray mat. Um, it tolerates drought and cold, salt spray, poor soils. You know, it kind of takes it all. It's deep rooted. It does have little yellow flowers. And this is a nice choice um, for a little interesting color. As you can see in this photo, it kind of provides a nice um, uh, alternative green color to say that those foundation plantings. Works nice in between stepping stones, which is a benefit. I've actually seen this, I don't recommend it, but I've seen it where cars kind of run over an edge of it. And it's, <laughs> it actually um, is, you know, doesn't look as good where the cars run over it, but it's still alive. So it's an incredibly uh, durable plant. Uh, this one, uh, Zoysia dianza, this one is a warm season grass. It's used on a lot of sports fields and golf courses. Um, again, it's pretty, it's, it's really tough. Uh, it takes heat and shade and, and even saline soil, which is tough and uh, does not require a, a lot of water. And as you can see, this really has the look of, um, of conventional turf. Probably not going to be quite as soft as conventional turf, but um, it has that nice kind of emerald green look. And on the other hand, if you're, if you're done with emerald green, then um, there's Carex flaca, the blue sedge. Um, this has that really pretty blue-green um, uh, color. It can get, you know, up to two feet tall. I've never really seen it that tall. Um, but you can, um, you know, you can easily keep it mowed. Again, the thing to bear in mind is that these ornamental grasses are bunch grasses. So um, in these cases, they're going to be a little bit bumpy, whereas a conventional turf lawn spreads by rhizomes, which just means it has a little underground roots that just spread out, and that's why it feels flat like a carpet. Um, so this one will need maybe a little bit more water than some of the others we've already talked about. It spreads a little bit, but it's not invasive. And um, uh, again, this is, um, I've seen this mowed as a uh, lawn and I thought it looked really nice. And that blue color was sort of uh, different, which is appealing. And um, this is a buffalo grass. Uh, this one calls, uh, this takes a, a special kind of user who doesn't mind um, plants browning out in um, the summer. Um, and of course, this is what our California, many of our California native plants um, some of them do, and why we got the name the Golden State, right? It turns um, tan in winter and lavender in autumn, this one does, um, but, it, but it dries out um, in, in summer. It can be slow to establish, and if you want to keep it green, you can water it up, but of course that would sort of defeat the purpose. Um, anyway, this would be um, a low maintenance alternative. And then here's one that we've that I see around town quite a bit called red fescue um, and the nice one of the selling points of this uh, plant is that it's shade tolerant and a lot of grasses uh, do not care for uh, too much shade but this one provides a nice lush feel it can be really long and billowy one to two feet long but look really pretty like I think that hillside looks really kind of nice they're soft but you can mow it as the photo underneath um, shows um, it prefers cool summers. Um, if it's grown in a hot summer area, it really um, will kind of, it'll kind of fry in, in um, full sun. So maybe give it a little bit of, um, a little bit of shade or partial shade. Um, and it's going to require a little bit more water when it's hot. But um, so really, I really consider this one more of a cool, cool season grass. And then this was sort of interesting, and I noticed um, right before I started this presentation, somebody had a, a question about um, uh, choices that are animal friendly. Well, uh, this is good old white clover, Trifolium repens. This is the, the what we used to call a weed that we dug out of our lawns, or our dads dug out of our lawns growing up. 
um, it makes a great lawn alternative. It takes, and talk about versatile, it takes center shade, it stays low, you can mow it or let it flower, and um, um, bees love the flower. It adds nitrogen to the soil. It's drought tolerant, green all year, doesn't mind lousy soil, and it, it does not leave any pet stains. So um, there are a lot of selling points to using good old clover um, in place of a lawn. And similarly, there's a plant that was developed. Um, this was developed through UC Davis um, and I think some others. Anyway, it's called Carapia and it's um, super durable. Uh, it takes drought as well as flooding. Um, it's um, super fast growing. It'll spread, uh, it's just one inch tall, but it'll kind of spread out a little bit. Um, and it's sterile, meaning it's not going to like seed in other places, so you don't have to worry about that. It's an excellent nectar source for butterflies, and it attracts bees. In fact, I have a friend who put this in her yard, in her garden, and she said that she couldn't believe how many bees um, uh, were attracted to it, so that's kind of cool. It has a very deep root system, so it makes it valuable for erosion control. They're even using it on um, hilly areas, on um, highway uh, shoulders, on rooftops, and public utility areas. So um, you know that it's super durable. So anyway, carapia, that's something to um, remember. And um, actually, carapia is available through um, this Delta Bluegrass sod um, alternative. They have all sorts of, Delta Bluegrass has all sorts of native and non-native blends. And um, as you can see here on the left, here's one that's um, a native blend that has been left to just sort of flop over and look soft and billowy. Or here's another one in the middle that, um, that has been mowed. So um, they're a really great resource um, that you can uh, check out online, Delta Bluegrass. And this is another um, uh, alternative called uh, Pacific Sod No Mow. And this is a, they have a very fine textured blend that also provides this sort of wavy meadow effect. Um, this one, like the red fescue, kind of prefers a little bit of afternoon shade, although it can take full sun in cooler areas. And one kind of fun thing, if you go to Pacific Sod to their website, um, they have this sod selection wizard that you put in sort of the specifics that you want and it'll, you know, um, crank out a recommendation for you. So that's kind of a fun thing to do. So let's say you want sort of a grassy look, but you don't need to walk on it. Let's look at some of those alternatives. Here's one called Dune Sedge. This is a Carex Panza. And just kind of like we were, what we were just talking about, you can, this one can be nice and big and floppy. I love, I actually love this photo on the left. I just think that looks so cool. And if you'd like planted a bunch of bulbs in there, um, say in the fall and they came up in the spring it looks so pretty like a little natural meadow or whatever or you could keep it more a little bit more manicured like on the right there and um, cut it down this one does spread by um, rhizomes but it but it also has this mounding uh, look so um, it's quite pretty and then uh, Carex tumulacola also called the foothill sedge is a native uh, grass. This one is a little larger scale. It gets about two feet tall and wide, actually probably a little wider, maybe about two feet tall and maybe two and a half feet wide. Um, it's also very versatile. It works in wet or dry soil. Um, it takes sun or part shade and that's kind of a big deal because if you're trying to, let's say you have an area that goes in and out of sun, it's hard to find plants that look consistent so it's really nice when you have a couple of plants that um, work in both. Um, it's drought tolerant once established and it's um, super easy and reliable. Great plant. Here's just another sedge, Carex uh, pregressilis. Um, this is also a native plant. Um, it stays low. As you can see, it has a, just a little bit of a lighter wispy feel. Um, this one um, one of the issues with this one is it really, sh um, in, in hot summer areas, um, it can go um, uh, dormant. So it can just sort of like decide, eh, I don't want this, I don't want to, I don't want to be a part of this heat. 
and um, just sort of go dormant. But um, it, can actually, it can actually take a little bit of foot traffic. Um, and this one works in sun or part sun. And this is a beautiful um, native grass called uh, the, this, the Mendocino reed grass. This is native to our coastal areas. So as you might imagine, it also likes a little bit cooler temperatures. Um, it produces these uh, dense mounds of kind of these gray green tones and with beautiful little purple um, streaks in the fall and winter. Really beautiful. And I love it when it's um, blooming like this on the right, the photo on the right, that's actually in my garden. It, um, I just think it has such a nice look. It reminds me of fireworks. <clears throat> and then another native, the deer grass, is a larger scale um, grass. It, um, it's incredibly easy and dependable. I have some that I've had for, you know, over a decade and, and um, it hasn't been a problem at all. Um, it kind of goes through when you first plant it. It goes through a little bit of a, a teenage phase where it just looks a little bit awkward that, you know, it just sort of sticks straight up. Um, but then it fills out to just have these beautiful um, um, see-through mounds. It's really, really quite lovely. And um, this is something also that you see around town um, a fair about, a fair a bit now called the blue fescue. Um, these, stay, these have these nice tidy little mounds um, <clears throat> and it can take, you know, full sun on a, in the coastal cooler climates, a little bit of shade inland, um, and it's drought tolerant when it's mature. But it does tend to be a little bit short-lived. If, if, if you've seen this, you may have noticed that after maybe five or six years or so, it kind of starts losing some of its beautiful blue tone. And so then you can either, of course, replace it or change it. So, you know, um, if you're looking for something that you're going to have super long term, this is probably not the one. And so let's just keep going through some other options just for fun here. So if you want to eat what was what was used to be your lawn, Here's an alternative. Here's a way to quickly uh, get rid of a lawn. You can just build raised beds right over it. And um, this kind of is, it, it sort of shows the, the sort of the principle of sheet composting, just doing it in a different way. I mean, there's no need to have any anything underneath those beds other than maybe some gopher wire. But I mean, you don't have to have cardboard or anything like that because you have totally snuffed out all the light that's gonna get to that lawn. Um, I do suggest, as this middle path sh um, shows, that uh, you know instead of using the leftover lawn for a path, it's really better to have a designated um, path, you know, in gravel or stone or brick or uh, mulch or something, because um, who wants to mow their path? And um, plus, you know, uh, lawn paths sound like they're going to be really great but they they end up just looking really run over and, and kind of muddy and nasty at least that's been my experience <clears throat> and here's an example of something where you could easily see have seen this as a um, just grass in the front right a lawn and you could just you know you don't have to put the raised beds in if you wanted to grow edibles you could just put your you know put your paths in sheet compost those middle areas and um, you're off to the races so that's an alternative. And so if it's evergreen you're after, there are just so many plants uh, to choose from. And I don't wanna belabor these, but there's, um, this is the mirror plant that comes in every um, you know, size and shape or color, I should say, just tons of different colors. Um, there's the germanders, um, the tucreums, which provide beautiful um, aromatic leaves and summer flowers, just a lovely low growing plant. Um, here's one of our native um, ground covers, incredibly important plant for wildlife, but, but deer don't eat it, so that's a, that's a selling point for many people. Um, it's um, an excellent choice for attracting beneficial insects, and it just grows, you know, a foot and a half to two feet tall, but it spreads way out to like 10 to 12 feet wide. And in the process, of course, it's nice because it helps snuff out any weeds that are underneath it. Um, so um, it's a really uh, important and um, nice uh, native plant. And of course, there's all the uh, manzanitas. And then there are so many to, uh, there are too many to list, but they are also native. They are, um, there's inland, there are choices for inland, there are choices for coastal. Um, Pacific mist is a nice choice for coastal areas. Emerald carpet 
for in inland. Um, the bees absolutely uh, love them. In fact, it's one of the first plants or the first native plants that bees sort of um, uh, use the bee, you know, at the end of winter when they're um, checking things out. Hummingbirds love them. So um, really the manzanitas um, are just a, a gorgeous choice. And of course, if you love color, there's the sky is the limit, hot colors and cool colors and succulents. Um, we see the, these all over now. They're just so gorgeous and architectural and just so interesting. This is somebody, um, uh, this is a, a neighbor around the corner, uh, around the um, corner from me. And, um, you know, it's, this person has built this nice little um, intricate succulent menagerie right in front. And it just, you know, just think how much little water they're using. And if that could easily be a lawn, right, especially on the left hand side there in front of the house. Um, it just, it's, I just find it so much more interesting than a lawn. And just like we were talking about with all the other plants, there's just so many beautiful ground covers like Creeping Thyme. And names you see all the time in a nursery, Verbena, Lantana, and Coreopsis. Colorful, long blooming, beautiful plants that don't use a lot of water. <clears throat> Here again, uh, my hundredth plug for natives. Um, uh, here's somebody who just threw out a whole lot of poppy seeds in the fall, and, and this is what they have in um, in the spring and uh, early summer. Really, really quite beautiful and colorful. And of course, we're always touting uh, um, creating habitat, and um, this is a not a difficult thing to do. It's just cr setting up the f um, you know being sure that we provide enough food and water and shelter for all the uh, living things that we want to invite into our gardens. And of course, permeable paths, you know, our goal with paths is to get water to soak down in back into the earth, recharge our groundwater. Um, so the, the saying is we want to slow it, spread it and sink it. And when that comes, when water, when rain will fall, for instance, falls on uh, a solid concrete surface, it, can't soak in and so more and more we're trying to to give um, rain permeable surfaces so you know this could this I could see as being a lawn area you know where you carve this path in through the middle of it and then you plant these lovely um, soft plantings on either side you use a fraction of the water of a lawn or maybe you just want to spruce up your entry uh, here's something where I could easily see this have, having been a lawn before um, these things were, uh, <clears throat> before it was changed. Uh, throw in a few boulders that, of course, it's not as if you can just pack those in your car, but um, it does provide a nice effect for this house. Um, here's another one where this is probably just three species of plants. I think it's probably just lavender and one of the grasses and uh, some ground cover up there. And, um, you know, really, again, a lot more interesting than grass. You know, here's something where you can really see, um, easily see this having a lawn and um, some pretty simple plantings. They just mirror on both sides of that path and um, super low maintenance. And maybe you just want to put a patio in. So again, back to the permeable surfaces, uh, you know, uh, pouring, putting gravel someplace is pretty easy. Let's water soak in, um, uh, you know, a, a uh, patio like the bottom right here is, is more complicated because, um, you know, you've got to get it set just right and firmed up and probably have somebody do that for you. But um, lots of beautiful ways to do that. So here's something where, again, that could have been a lawn that's just replaced by gravel, has that super Mediterranean feel. And of course, you don't have to give up all your water. And speaking of habitat, um, just use it widely, wisely instead. Um, just just a quick reminder to add a little water for um, birds and hummingbirds where your lawn was. Less lawn, more pond. Yeah, here's a nice weekend project. I, I can't even imagine how long something like that took to uh, to uh, create, but um, yeah, for the for the brave souls out there. And here's something that shows how even if something had like a drain pipe underneath it, um, you know, a lawn area, for instance, um, you can actually even make that uh, beautiful and sort of more naturalistic. So it's um, kind of a lovely way to go. 
And a couple last minute uh, final um, ways to use what was a lawn. Um, play area for kids or grandkids is, um, you know, when my kids were young, they actually used surfaces like this a whole lot more than a lawn. So, uh, you know, riding their little cart, you know, their little bike trikes and things around. So um, you can do all sorts of fun things with that. Or of course, you can always create your own secret little garden getaway. And uh, who doesn't need that, right? Especially these days. So um, the easiest way is to just go um, to get more of this information is go to our website. We have a choose plants page um, that you can get right from our homepage that will give you all sorts of ideas for plants and um, and uh, for lists of plants. So I am going to stop sharing now. Turn on my video. So, okay. So. All right, thank you so much, Marie. That was really awesome to see. And I loved all the, the photos giving me ideas for my own. Back to it, I good, good. I, I paused there, I lost um, lost connection there for a second. Anyways, hi again. Um, if anyone has any questions for Marie, please type them into the chat box at the bottom of your screen or top of your screen, depending on where you have the functions located. Um, uh, I, I, well, if you have any questions, please type. I'm going to speak just a little bit to get people to, if they have questions to type. Um, I will be, we did record this presentation, so I will be sending out the link hopefully later today or early tomorrow, depending on how long it takes to download and upload. It sometimes takes a little bit of time. Uh, with, and when I send out the link, I'll also be sending a follow-up email with how to contact Marine Master Gardeners, their website, as well as um, the Marine Master Gardener presentation survey. They uh, really like hearing how everyone liked the presentation. As, uh, any other information you can share with them is really helpful while they are um, creating these virtual and maybe eventually in-person presentations. Again, I have no clue when that will be, but maybe, maybe we'll have that again in life. Um, so the, uh, look for that email from me later today or early tomorrow. I'm sending it to everybody who registered. We do have some questions in the chat box. Thank you. Um, Leslie has asked that my front lawn has a thirsty birch tree with roots that come to the surface for water. What is the best way to make sure the tree gets enough water? Do you suggest a drip? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not an irrigation specialist and I know there are, um, there are ways, I think there are special emitters still for, um, watering, uh, trees. Uh, I don't know if any of the other master gardeners here want to, uh, chime in on that, but yeah, uh, some type of emitters that you, you know, you can use drip or something like it around your tree, um, would be great. Okay. Oh, and Faith says, how long will the recording be available? Um, I upload these recordings to our YouTube channel, and unless a speaker asks me to take it down after a certain amount of time, it's up there um, as long as it's as long as it's uh, the internet is alive, I guess. Um, no one has asked me to take things down, so it'll be up there for a while. And Cindy has asked. Um, uh, she seconds the question about walkable ground cover that doesn't brown out with dog pee. Yeah, the one that comes, the first one that comes to mind is the uh, white clover, Trifolium repens. By the way, if you order any of these, if you order any plant ever, be sure you use the botanical name because common names are dangerous. Some of their common names can, there are, are used in, you know, for multiple plants or multiple names for a plant so forth. So try and use the botanical name. So um, for, for the, the um, for your needs, you could literally get, you know, get your soil squared away and then just literally get seeds. You can order seed of Trifolium repens. And this would be a good time to, um, well, actually, maybe even spring for something like that's going to need to germinate would be a good time to sprinkle something like that. And um, your dogs, you know, should not cause any problems with it. Right, there is... Um, Zoysia, does Zoysia grass yeah. go brown? I don't Sorry. think so. I think that is an evergreen grass. I might have to look into that a little further, but it's used for in um, 
uh, you know, sports fields. So that leads me to believe that it's, it's evergreen. Um, yeah. It's the, the one that goes, the one that browns out is the um, buffalo grass. Uh, where can we order trifolium repens, white clover seeds or seedlings? This one, you just need the seeds. Um, you know, I would just look online. I would look online or you could also check with your local nurseryman at a, your local nursery and see if he can order it for you, he or she. Um, um, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking of a uh, nursery by me. I think that he often does um, seed orders. So that's how I would do it. <clears throat> Any more questions? I had to turn off my video because I was having connection issues, but there any more questions, please type them into the chat. Looks like we're good. Thank you. Thank you, Judith, for, for uh, attending. This is great. <laughs> okay. All right, everybody. Thank you all for joining us today. I'm going to end the meeting very soon, so it's going to be super quick. Bye.